Can we get started? Good evening, and I'd like to welcome everybody to MIT. And it's nice to see another large crowd for our annual Freeman Lecture. I'll give just a few brief words of introduction, and then Linda Hager from BSCE and Bob Schreiber will do the, the real introductions. My name is Eric Adams. I'm from MIT, and I'm one of seven members of the Freeman Committee. And each year, we get together and sponsor this annual event uh, in conjunction with BSCE and MIT as a way of honoring uh, the memory of John Freeman. Uh, you might have seen the materials out in the lobby as you were eating that are describing BSCE's activities. This is one of a number of activities that BSCE engages in, and I think uh, Linda will mention a couple others. We're also sending around a sign-up sheet. Um, if you haven't already signed it, we'd be interested in knowing basically uh, where our audience is coming from. If you wouldn't mind just signing that, that, that would help us uh, as far as the demographics are concerned. As most of you know, John Freeman was a graduate of MIT. He was one of the most renowned engineers uh, that we've had. Uh, from this area. He worked mainly uh, in the beginning of the last century, and he's known uh, probably most remarkably around here for his work in the design of the original Charles River Dam um, by the Science Museum. <clears throat> when he passed away, before he passed away, he gave a sum of money that was in his name, the purpose of which was to help with the education of young hydraulic engineers, broadly interpreted. And this annual event is one of the ways that uh, we use that money in his memory. We also support a number of small fellowships that go to students and young engineers for research and, and other academic type uh, pursuits. If you're interested in finding out more about the committee or about the uh, scholarships or want to see videos of some of the recent Freeman lectures, you're invited to take a look at the website. The easiest way to access the website, I think, is to Google Freeman Fund, and it's the first thing that will come up. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Hager. Good evening, and welcome all of you here tonight. As um, Eric had mentioned, I'm Linda Hager, and I'm president of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers. Um, I was just wondering, how many of you here tonight are students? If I can just have a show of hands. So we have a great turnout of students. And how many are actually ASCE or BSCE members? Oh, wow, that's great. So, um, for, for those of you who are students, I just want to let you know that I began my service to um, ASCE as a student. And um, I participated in the uh, concrete canoe race. We didn't have the steel bridge contest at that time. And moved up the ranks and ended up becoming president of my student chapter. And then eventually, of course, um, when I uh, got my first job, I stayed connected with ASCE. It's a great way to um, a network and to get involved and meet other engineers, aside from just your coworkers. Um, it seems like we have a lot of members, so you probably all know that BSC is actually the oldest society in the nation, and um, it's even older than ASCE. Uh, we became a member of ASCE in 1974. Uh, we currently have over 3,500 members throughout the state. Uh, some of those are Western Mass Branch members, and um, we have more than 700 students that are included in this uh, statistic of members. Um, let's see, we have many opportunities for professional interaction and growth. We offer a vast array of civil engineering educational programs to the engineering community and through our outreach program to potential future young engineers from grades K through um, the college graduate level. Uh, we publish a monthly newsletter and a semi-annual annual technical journal. And the technical journal is very unique to the uh, Boston section of ASCE. We offer lectures and seminars at a discount price to students. And also, we offer them at a lower cost to members. So if you're interested in uh, 
going to uh, more of in the events such as this, uh, many of them, this is unusual, this is, happens to be a free event, and um, many of them you have to charge for the uh, technical events. But if you're a member, you get a discount rate. If you're a student, you get an even lower rate. Um, let's see, we have technical programs, we have 10 of them. And I think this one is jointly sponsored by our environmental and water resources technical group. We also have um, nine other technical groups. And if you want to find out about uh, the technical groups and you want to become more active, you can just go on to our website, which is bsces.org. And also, in reference to um, getting, in getting the Freeman Fund website, you can also go on to bsces.org. And I'm not exactly sure which pull-down menu it is, but if you go through the pull-down menus, I think it's um, under, is anybody, any do you know? Committees. Uh, you'll find the Freeman Fund Committee, and you can go through that way and get information on the uh, committee. Um, for those of you who are actual college students, we offer several scholarships, and you can get those under um, resources on the bsce.org website. Or there's an orange sheet, looks like this, it's out on the table, you can pick one of those up. And this gives you a list of some of the scholarships that we offer. Um, there's a few other events that are going on. We have, actually BSCE has their annual meeting on um, June 10th, and that will be at the Radisson, and I hope that uh, many of you will consider attending that event. Um, the Young Member Group has their 20th annual Red Sox outing on September 3rd, and these tickets go fast. That's why you see the flyer now. That's out on the table if anybody's interested. Um, we have an event on April 23rd, What's Brewing at Massport, Issues and Challenges and Prospects. Uh, Thomas J. Kinton, Jr., Chief Executive Office of Massport, will be speaking at that event. Um, on April 17th, there's an event, Redeveloping the World Trade Center from the ground up. Um, these are all at the Radisson. And then there's another one, if anybody's interested in the political side of engineering, we have a special day set aside where um, several organizations throughout the state participate. Um, Design Professionals Day at the State House, and that's on Tuesday, May 13th from 12 to three. And that looks like this, and that's also out on the table. Um, if you have any other questions concerning BSCE, uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, you just go to the website, bsce.org, and you, you can call the Engineering Center as well. And I'm looking for Rich Keenan, who's our Executive Director. At this time, I'd like to introduce Bob Schreiber, who will be introducing the speaker. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Linda. And I, I would have to attest uh, to what she was saying in terms of membership in BSCE. And with that in mind, I just wanted to find out, is the sign-up sheet being passed around at this point? So it's going around. Okay, great. So keep that moving along. Thank you. Um, I've got the great pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Brendan Harley as our Freeman lecturer for 2008. Um, it's my pleasure because I've worked for Brendan for over 31 years, almost 32 years. And I've got to say that he's quite an inspiration and fits very well with uh, being the Freeman lecturer with John Freeman being that kind of an inspirational engineer. Uh, just as Linda did earlier in terms of having you raise your hands with, uh, you know, who's a member of BSCE or ASCE, I think if I asked you to raise your hand if you've ever worked with or for Brendan, we probably have dozens of people raising their hand and attesting to what, I, to what I'm saying. Um, to speak to that, here's the original list. It goes on to two pages, and this is the short list of Brendan's accomplishments. And he said, well, how about let's going a little bit shorter? So <laughs> I'm going to go with the shorter version now. But I uh, just wanted to read to you some of the accomplishments that he's had leading into uh, the talk tonight. Uh, Dr. Harley was a, a student of Professor Pete Eagleson and also Frank Perkins uh, at the MIT Water Resources Laboratory back in the late 60s and uh, into the early 70s. Uh, he was involved in the development of some of the first generation of urban runoff simulation models, 
Um, he served on the MIT faculty in 1971 to 72, and then was a founder of a company, a small water resource modeling company called Resource Analysis Incorporated, or RAI. Um, at that firm, where several of us went to work for Brendan, uh, we all specialized in uh, water resources modeling. He was partnered with Professor Frank Perkins, uh, uh, David Marks, and also John Shockey, who I'm sure that uh, some of you older folks know pretty well. Um, Brendan's been with CDM since uh, CDM uh, bought us back in uh, very late 1978. Uh, he's the senior vice president, uh, works on groundwater and surface water simulation projects globally. Uh, he's been active in Singapore since 1980 and has been involved in several state-of-the-art urban water resources projects on the island. Um, he originally conceived with others uh, the Marina Barrage project in 1985 over 20 years ago, and has worked on its ultimate development ever since. Uh, he's presently the project director for the construction of this multi-purpose facility. Uh, Brendan has also worked overseas on projects in Sydney, Manila, Hong Kong, Dublin, West Bank, Gaza, many places around the world. And in terms of challenging projects, which CDM management seems to always select Brendan for the most challenging projects for good reason, uh, he's also the project director for the New York City long-term master plan, uh, and that was immediately prior to his current assignment in Singapore. Last year, he, was, uh, he attained the status of a BSC Life member, um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brendan. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I guess this mic is on, so I, I will stay away from that mic. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. I, I think all of us have uh, been very fascinated with what uh, John Freeman achieved back 100 years ago. This project is almost in the same category as the Charles, and in, in many ways this was the inspiration for Marina Barrage. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a thumbnail sketch of the development of this project, how, what it takes how it can almost consume half of one's total career, how it morphs over time into a project very different than what you started with. For those of you who are modelers, a warning that be careful what you simulate, they might build it, and they will check it to see if it's working, and in places like Singapore, they will do that in your lifetime. In the States, you're probably saved by EISs for a long time. So what we're going to do is run through the, the process of the evolution of the barrage, what it is, what it's going to do to Singapore. It really is a, is a city-changing facility, just like the Charles Dam was for Boston and Cambridge. And it's been my privilege to have worked on it as a young engineer and then work on the subsequent development. And then for my sins, I get assigned as project director for the last few years, which again has been a fascinating challenge. Whoops. Okay, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge a whole lot of people who contribute to this, and, and these are the key players. PUB Singapore is the client, the Public Utilities Board. Co Brothers are the contractors in Singapore. You'll see a lot of fascinating architecture here. Interestingly enough, nearly all of that was done by Singapore itself, so as a, as a country, it's come a long way. Mo Wang Yi is the Director of Best Sourcing of PUB. He's the person responsible for construction. Yap Keng Guan is the person responsible for the concept and, and design of this. Quek is the assistant project director. He's my right-hand man. He really keeps the construction rolling every day. And then there's a whole bunch of CDMers who've been involved in this project over the last 25 years, and I'd like to give them all credit for what they've done. Without them, I, I couldn't get it, uh, get it done. Bob Fitzgerald and others are still answering questions every day from us as they come up, and, and they truly are a, a real support team. Okay, where and what is Marina Barrage? For those of you who know Singapore, are there many Singaporeans here? Ah, there, I would be surprised if there weren't some at, at MIT. Um, what we have here is downtown Singapore and the Singapore River, the historic Singapore River, the present commercial district, this area out here which is called Marina South, on which they're going to develop a humongous integrated resort, casino in quotes, 
which has a development cost of the order of five billion U.S. dollars, just to give you an idea of the scale of things. A whole new commercial district that's being developed. A Singapore flyer, which is taller than the London Eye. And Marina Barai sits across the mouth of this new harbor. This is all reclaimed land down here. And we, it will control this whole reservoir in the city and the watersheds feeding it. The structure itself looks like this. It, a barrage is basically a low head dam across the river, supported in this case by a pump station with a very innovative design, and we'll get back to talk about those. So what we're going to do in the lecture is talk about how Marina Barrage evolved, because these kind of projects don't just develop by themselves. They come step by step. What Singapore is doing in flood control and water supply management, because I think everyone needs to pay attention to what Singapore is doing. It's where most U.S. cities will probably be in 10 or 20 years. It's going to take longer to get here, but places like L.A. are going to move in this direction. Other places that are water short have a lot to learn from Singapore. And even in Boston, we have a lot to learn. And for those of you of any Irish connections like me, the surprising thing is Dublin is probably the city that needs to learn quickest and fastest from Singapore. They have a huge water shortage over there. I know they drink a lot of Guinness, but they don't have enough water. They need to learn from Singapore. How a project like this can be a major economic driver. The, the spin-offs from a project like this are huge. And then connection to Boston, Charles River, and MIT. These are intimate players in what's evolved. For those of you who don't know where Singapore is, it's almost exactly halfway around the world. It's on the tip of the Malay Peninsula. It's a relatively small island. As you can see here, it's only about 25 miles long and 15 miles top to bottom. Um, quite small, just sits one degree north of the equator, which means it's hot and humid all year round, 90 degrees and 90% humidity. Don't believe the 75, that must have been on a very cold night sometime that I wasn't there. Present population is about four and a half million. When we did a lot of these planning studies back in the mid 80s, it was about three million, forecast to stabilize at 3.2. Um, the government has decided to grow, and as Singaporeans know, the transit systems and everything else is overcrowded at four and a half, but they're planning to go to six million, which puts a lot of pressure on everything. 264 square miles total on the island, although they are filling areas and developing it, that's about it. 17,000 people per square mile. It gets up there to Manhattan levels. Rainfall of almost 100 inches a year. Um, gully washers of four to six inches, monsoon storms are very common. Limited water supply and a rapidly expanding, expanding economy. That's what we're working in. So really, where did the barrage come from? It really was the confluence of several other projects which were undertaken back in the 80s, and even most Singaporeans are not aware of this. One of these was a flood control project called the Bukatima project, which dealt with major flooding in a commercial corridor in downtown Singapore. The other one is the Badak Salatar scheme, which dealt with water supply. And we'll deal with both of those. They were happening almost simultaneously in two different branches of government, which at that time used to fight like hell. One was ENV, who handled drainage. The other one was PUB, who handled water supply. They're now in one agency. But 25 years ago, it was quite different. But they came together, and ultimately, Marina Barrage evolved from that. The barrage sits down here. This is probably the first map, detailed map you've seen. In the old Singapore Harbor, surrounded by area that's all reclaimed from the sea. When I was first in Singapore in 79 and 80, in fact, there was hydraulic dredging and landfilling going on at that stage, creating this land. So the flood control aspect of Marina Barrage and other projects is very high rainfall and dense urbanization. The land converted from semi-jungle to urban area very, very quickly, particularly once uh, Singapore became independent and started clearing out its slums. There's a relatively high tide range, about three meters. <clears throat> the low-lying parts of downtown Singapore are, in fact, below the levels of the king high tides or the spring high tides we get. So they would get natural flooding from this, and they've had small tide gates in place for a long time. Whoops. So ever since the early 70s, when Singapore really got a professional planning group, they have been developing a very effective monsoon network or monsoon drain network. They wanted to get on top of their flooding, and it's largely solved at this stage. When you read about floods in Jakarta 
in Johor Bahru and other places, we go through those storms in Singapore with barely a hiccup. If you get a couple of inches in a low-lying area, they consider it serious. So they develop new towns with very well-planned drainage systems on top of everything else. And flooding is not a problem. Flood-prone areas have been reduced to very minimal amounts. And the Bukatima scheme was a key component in dealing with a very serious flooding problem that they had. The Bukatima catchment is a very large catchment that sits here feeding Marina Reservoir. It drains through areas like Little India, old areas which are very flood prone, very low lying. And they had <clears throat> back in between 68 and 82, 50 flooding events, for example. Four to 500 hectares were flooded. The depths of the flooding was up to a meter at this place called Newton Circus, which was, is a major traffic junction, at least was in those days. For those of you old enough, in fact, the bus schedules in Singapore used to have a page for flood routes or disruption during flooding. It happened so frequently. CDM got brought in to really bring in some of the models we developed at MIT and begin to look at how to control this flooding, what could be done. It was a, the, probably the first major application of the models that had been developed in the late 60s here and really put into practice. Um, and we did, we did a bunch of studies looking at could you correct the problems of this canal, which in some places was only seven or eight meters wide. And the ultimate decision was no, we had to do a major transbasin diversion. That diversion canal is 32 meters wide to give you an idea of the scale of the increased facilities that had to be built to deal with urbanization and the increased runoff. This is a classic example of what happens when you switch from dense jungle to heavily urbanized areas. There were actually two, there's, uh, there's also an upstream one. We cut off the upper half of the catchment totally. This one is diverted around here, but it comes back down into Marina Bay. So the old river flowed down here. This one goes around the side and comes back in. So they both come together still into Marina Bay. Now, that scheme was, was studied in 83, 84, was constructed uh, during the late 80s. Dick Laramie, who was here tonight, spent a whole bunch of time over there modeling it. And actually, it has been very successful since it has been implemented. We've had about 20 years with zero flooding in this area. It went from frequent to zero. So it, now it's been close to bank full a couple of times. So in fact, the models were fairly good. We were pushing the limit. Part of the argument you get into, and for those of you who are younger engineers, they set design standards for five-year floods. In the urban planning business, we need to get beyond that. We can't have things flooding at five years. For open channels, we usually have some freeboard. We design these to be able to handle the 25 to 50 year flood by using the freeboard in the canals. Beyond that, we'd get some flooding, and, and the approach has also been to look at the consequences of that flooding if you get a 100 year one. It should still be manageable, it shouldn't be catastrophic. But we need to get above this idea of five year floods. It's just ridiculous for urban areas. But that's part of the battle that goes on between professionals looking at it and some urban planners who have a different view of, of flooding. The diversion canal, as I say, is, looks like this. This actually is a piece of the main canal. It's not a small canal, 35 to 40 meters wide, built on marine clays. It actually floats on Bacow piles at about one foot centers or 18 inch centers, a tremendous number of wooden piles. However, this by itself would not solve all of the problem in the low-lying area. You still had the tidal problem. So it would, it would take a barrage kind of facility to deal with that. It was recognized at the time. It was studied at the time. And we kicked around the concept of where you might put it. Now, what is a barrage and how does it work? The present Singapore situation looks like this. Low-lying areas in downtown Singapore, when we get high tides, spring tides, particularly the tides near the equinox, are high enough by themselves to create flooding. You don't need any rainfall. A little bit of a storm on top of it, and you'll get flooding. So the idea is to build a low head dam across the mouth of the river. So you've got a stable reservoir upstream that you keep at a lower level. It also becomes fresh. That's not a, unusual in Singapore, but you've got gates here. Now when it rains at low tide, you open the gates, and it just discharges out, and because the tide has never backfilled this area first. You've got a meter or a meter and a half of freeboard before 
you get into trouble. If you have a high tide coincident with the rain, you have to pump. So you've got pumps and gates that are working together. The Charles River Dam here is similar to that, although the response times are much slower. Singapore, it takes about 20 minutes to go from the peak of the storm to the peak of the inflow hydrograph to the reservoir. Here it's several days. So these are the benefits of the barrage as discussed with people back then. It would provide flood protection, the ultimate flood protection to all these low-lying areas. These areas which have a three meter tide have exposed mud banks so that you can't really use them for recreational purposes. Those of you who've been on the Singapore River, you used to see the bottom at times and it's ugly. However, in the mid 80s, the Singapore and Kalang Rivers were still heavily polluted. They hadn't cleaned them up yet. There were also bum boats for cargo transfer and in fact there were shipyards in Kalang Bay. So to support those, we would have required relatively large ship locks. Those added a degree of complexity, which made it very difficult to keep the basin fresh. However, we did point out how similar this was to the situation the Charles River was in about the turn of the last century. About 1900, when the Charles was tidal, it was a mosquito-infested swamp. It's hard to believe it now, but that's what it was. So we presented this to the various agencies in Singapore. This is what you would try to achieve for the Singapore River and some of the neighboring areas. What does it do? We all know the Charles brings life to the whole of Boston. Without the Charles, this would be a very different city. Fortunately, most of the senior urban planners and PUB staff have gone to school to that place up the river, you know, usually. Not a whole lot of them come to MIT, but we're still working on that. But they know of the Charles. They know how, how effective it is as a, a breathing space for the city. And they were also intrigued with the similarity of this situation to what had existed back 100 years ago in Boston. Their situation was like where we were. The, the Singapore River in those days was really a stinking mud hole, was probably the best you could, you could describe it as. I'm sorry to insult the Singaporeans, but they know how bad it was. Okay, so they decided to defer the implementation. At the time, it wasn't cost effective. We were looking at it only for flood control, and we were looking at about 100 to 150 million Singapore dollars, 100 million US in round numbers, which was expensive for a single use project, although the Bukatima scheme by itself cost about that amount of money. The areas around the Singapore River were starting to be upgraded. They were never sure how much the population would really take to clean up rivers. You were fighting a cultural change in Singapore that went from you know, I can spit in the river and do even worse in the river any place I like to treat the water with respect. That's an amazing change that's occurred in Singapore, but this was just the start of it. There wasn't any demand for lifestyle or recreational activity. Singapore was screwed down pretty tight. You went to work, you went home, you didn't enjoy yourself. Um, that, that was the reality. That's not Singapore now, but the reality back in the early 80s was Singapore was not a society where people went out and enjoyed themselves. The interesting thing is once you put on the table the concept of the barrage, once it was kicked around at the senior levels of government, it then entered the planning concepts. So although it sat in a deferred state for many years, it actually has entered into the whole planning of downtown Singapore that someday a barrage would be in place. None of what you see around the Singapore River right now on Marina Bay where the casino is would have occurred without the barrage. So although they didn't move forward with the barrage, it was in their planning cycle, which sort of says you need to surface these things and work with agencies, recognizing it may take some time to get there. Also, the potential for water supply was evaluated. None of us thought of this as a source of water back in the mid-80s, but that was also being evolved, and it became a multi-purpose project for continued planning. So step by step, people were working on it. The second goal of the Marina Barrage scheme is water supply. A, a very significant challenge in Singapore is water supply for the island. Historically, most of the sources were in mainland Malaysia, typically water treatment plants fed by rivers. They are still imported into Singapore, and it poses, from the country's point of view, a strategic risk. Um, although relations between the two countries are good, there are several treaties that, that control the supply of water. 
One expires in 2011, the other one is good until 2061 or so. <clears throat> but um, as in any country, it wants to be independent. You got a lot of rainfall in Singapore, plenty of rainfall, but no protected catchments. We don't have Quabbin watershed out there. We don't have Quabbin out there. We've got downtown Boston to collect the water on. There are a lot of newly developed towns, and PUB back in the early 80s was kicking around the concept of using those as water supply catchment areas. Could you build these with clean enough drainage features so they could serve as a, as a good source of water supply? Now, there is a four national tap strategy in Singapore that you should be aware of, because this, I think, is going to be where all of us are, and they just adopted this way of describing it. One is local catchments. What can we supply from local water supplies? The second one is imported water. The third one is reclaimed water called new water. This is directly reclaimed sewage, which I forgot to bring my bottle of new water here. It, it, you, in fact, can drink it. It's a little flat. But it is a huge source of water. In particular, uh, they are going to, the total supply to the island is 350 million gallons a day, plus or minus. By the end of the new expansion of the Changi plant, they'll have 100 million gallons a day of new water. Most of it going to industry. Industry likes this water. It's basically DI water. So it, it is very beneficial. And excess water goes back into the raw water reservoirs. We need to be back in this area in the U.S., no reason not to be. Finally, they have desalinated water. All of these feed together into their system, but this is a source of water that's not insignificant. It's a huge quantity when you get 100 inches of rain a year. The only protected upland catchments that Singapore have is this small little area up in the middle of the island where the elevations are like 100 meters. That's about as high as it gets. There's a little bit of jungle up there still, um, largely infested, as we say, with the um, MINDEF and their training grounds. Uh, you, you can't go in there. It's not the snakes will get you. It's, it's um, guys practicing shooting with maybe not so good aim. Um, but up in this area, there is a little bit. Also, the zoo is there. There's a, there's a little bit of catchment that's considered pristine, considered protected. There's also what they classify as unprotected catchments. These are all of these new urban areas which have well-designed drainage schemes. You know here, the pressure from EPA is if there's any gray water to get it out of the sewage system and put it back into the, the, the drains or the storm drains. At least that used to be the case. In Singapore, it's the opposite. If there's any water that's considered gray, put it into the sewer system. We'll take it to the treatment plant. We're now reclaiming it anyway but we keep it out of the storm drains, which truly are feeding our water supply catchments. And then, the, whoops, sorry. And then there's the last source, which are uncontrolled catchments. These are the older urban areas, which to date we have not really picked up on for use as water supply. Marina Barrage Scheme is the first of those. For reservoirs, PUB has done an amazing job. They started out from the Brits with a few reservoirs in the middle of the island. What they did is they built this necklace of, of reservoirs around the island. Every estuary, in fact, has been dammed and is converted to fresh water. Uh, Marina Reservoir is the, is the 15th of these reservoirs in Singapore. So we have coastal reservoirs. We have a few urban reservoirs, like Badak Reservoir, in the middle of the system. And all of them are acting together to meet their water supply needs. The Doxalator scheme is an interesting one that is really the first true water, urban water harvesting scheme. It is a large-scale project. It was built in conjunction with a couple of the new towns. And new towns in Singapore really are 200,000 people per town or a quarter million people per town. They're fairly big, dense areas. But this was built as part of them. It was conceived in... Whoops... I'm sorry. It was conceived in the, in the late 70s, designed actually by CDM, simulated by CDM in 1980-81, and constructed and has been operational for 25 years. It can deliver 30 million gallons of water and uh, sits here on the eastern part of the island. In fact, if any of you are at Changi Airport, the water you drink there comes from the Bidoxalator scheme. 
So it's, it's a, it is a source of water. There's about 400,000 people living in the towns that supply the water to this area. It's captured in this reservoir, which was an estuary converted from the sea, and an old sand quarry that was converted to an estuary, much deeper. These now are both major recreational areas. They're about 10 kilometers apart. We actually move water between them to maximize the yield. They feed a relatively conventional treatment plant. It's a dual media filters, nothing fancy on it, but the water quality has been exceptionally good. Now, the interesting thing is everyone says water from urban areas is terrible. This particular one has better water quality than the upland reservoirs in Singapore. So a well-managed urban system with some urban runoff in there actually can deliver you very good water quality that you can treat quite easily. We make the case that industrial zones are not put into these unprotected catchments, as they call them, these managed catchments. Those are kept outside in separate industrial zones. Things like large parking lots and vehicle maintenance areas are covered, and their runoff goes to the sewer system. <clears throat> but the scheme proved that you, in fact, could capture this rainfall quite effectively. The net capture is about 50% to 55% of the total rainfall that falls on the catchment. You can capture the peak flows, obviously, and we do bypass the first flush effect. But you can capture 50 to 55 percent quite reasonably with the facilities that are built. This gave everyone confidence that you can move forward and do these elsewhere on the island. Right now, this shows the percentage of Singapore that, in fact, is being used as water supply areas. Marina Basin is a big chunk. This is 16 percent of the whole island feeds down here. There's a couple of other new schemes up here, but by 2011, basically two-thirds of Singapore will be acting as a water catchment. So here you have a dense city that is largely providing a lot of its own water, something that other places need to learn, and you need not be threatened by urban runoff is the key message here. So Marina Barrage, by 2000 or so, a couple of things had, had happened. The development pressures in downtown Singapore had changed. It was now time to move forward with Marina Bay and planning, and water treatment technologies had evolved. The initial new water plants had shown that you could treat basically tertiary treated sewage back to drinking levels. The water that we have in Marina Bay and Marina Reservoir is certainly better than tertiary treated sewage most of the time, not always. We, but using membrane technology and treatment plants, we can treat it to drinking water standards without any problems. So that freed it up that the water could be viewed as a source of potable water not just second, really low-grade, second-grade water that PUB did not want to have to handle in its system at all. So we had urbanization. The river cleanup had led to whole increases in lifestyle. Singaporeans want to sail. They want to water ski. They want to kayak. They want dragon boat racing. They never stop wanting activities. New water had shown it was feasible. And so PUB coined the term three-in-one project for Marina Barrage. It really met multiple purposes and all of a sudden it became very cost effective for them to move forward. So its primary purpose is flood control. That's what it was conceived for. Water supply largely helped uh, justify its construction and lifestyle became a huge benefit to the community as a whole. And by now, this is almost the biggest benefit of the project. It's interesting, it's flipped around as to what it does. Now you'll, you'll see that this is a very interesting looking building. This is not a typical pump station. Um, it didn't start off like this. It started out looking more like a typical CDM design pump station. We had some very interesting interaction with the planners in Singapore as to what this building should be. It sits right at the mouth of Singapore Harbor. It's not Sydney Opera House, but it's close to that. It really is going to be an iconic landmark in Singapore. At the same time, it was supposed to blend into this downtown botanical park that, that abuts it. So over time, this project evolved into this unique shape with lots of, of different purposes. And that's been part of the fun of working on this project. It's not just a typical civil engineering project. And that's what we want to look at here, is how a project like this really can be a major help to, a, to the city as a whole. This is where it sits, right at the mouth of Singapore Harbor. The barrage is basically this dam across the river. Upstream from it is all this development. These are parks on both sides. It's a necklace. Again, the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore, which is modeled after the BRA, 
It's much more aggressive than the BRA, however, and as those of you who come from Singapore, URA is a very powerful agency. It really aggressively plans, but they pick up on concepts from elsewhere. They like the concept of this necklace of parks, this breathing space for the city, so they picked up on that. We sit down here, and it, as I said, it morphed from a simple civil engineering project to a major public facility. We deal with all of these agencies, <clears throat> many of whom, like the tourist board and other people, you think had nothing to do with us in, in just building a flood control facility. And they've expanded potential uses and users. It used to be in Singapore, any facility that was a water supply plant or something that was considered critical had barbed wire. In fact, it had a fence around it, usually with a little icon of a guy shooting a gun at you if you went into it. Uh, these guys are laughing because they know that's there. It's still there in a lot of facilities. There was a mentality within PUB that that's the way it should be. No one should go here. In fact, when we designed this facility, it was like that. Even if it had some of this shape, it wasn't going to be available to the public. But PUB reorganized. They got a new CEO, and we got a new minister who said, heck, guys, you control all of these water resources. Let the people use them. They use them on the Charles. The Charles doesn't go belly up just because there's a few people sailing on it. So they've changed the whole use in Singapore. They've changed the whole approach to the public. Now, all of this building is fully open to the public, which led to CDM having to do some interesting redesign because hence, beforehand, it was purely a few operators in there. Now it's a public facility, and we'll show you a lot more of that. So it's a high visibility site with architectural requirements. We got all of the urban architects in Singapore saying, this is what it should look like. This is how it has to be. This is accessibility. The prime minister said they're going to integrate the water bodies with parks and green spaces and turn Singapore into the city of gardens and waters. That's their plan. And in the next five to 10 years, they're going to achieve it. This is the single biggest project in that. This is the one that starts it. We sit right here. All of this development around here is a function of what the barrage does. The barrage is going to be intimately linked with all of these. This is the casino. And this, I think, as we call this suicide leap for people who don't make some money. We can't quite figure out why the architect would ever build. And this is about 500 feet up in the air, a place, a little platform that you can, in fact, it has a hole in the middle. It gets even more intriguing. <laughs> I don't know what the feng shui for that is, but we stay away from it. The Singapore Flyer and already offers a fantastic view of the barrage. You can see stuff. You can see all of the ships in the harbor outside. So we sit in a key area. This is what they want this, the place to look like. This actually is fireworks of one of their New Year's Eve celebrations. It is a tremendously active place, even at the present time. And especially now that we've taken the tidal range out of it, because the project is up and running, there's even more activities there. So the design requirements, they kept saying it's beyond engineering. You have to think differently. You have to think much more openly. So it's a unique showcase of Singapore's efforts and achievement in urban water management and environmental sustainability. So it's a sustainable building. Urban water management, most of the architectural f people involved are Singaporeans. It has to blend into this garden by the bay, be an iconic structure, and yet be a welcoming venue for everybody. These were the challenges that, that we were faced with three to four or five years ago as the project was evolving. And it's still evolving. This is a project that it's not design and then bid. It, it has evolved all the way along. They wanted it to be open to the public, which I said was a new concept for PUB. This may be something that, that you know people like NWRA will address. Why is Quabbin still close to a lot of activities, for example? LA has some of the same problems with some of its reservoirs. There's no reason we have to isolate them from the public. Some of that was public health standards back in the dark ages, but now with modern treatment plants, we can do better. We can use these facilities differently. A multimedia exhibition and, and water-focused activities for the community as a whole to enjoy. They wanted recreational activities in the central courtyard so families can come and play there. There's a grass roof structure, so it, 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 it's environmental in that sense. There's a large solar energy facility on the roof. And the roof has a fantastic view of downtown Singapore and all the way over to Indonesia. And is nice and breezy, actually, in the afternoons. At midday, you don't want to go there. It's too hot. So this is what they want for families, for schools, 
They are planning to bring about 15,000 students a month through this facility, just to give you an idea of what, what we expect as loads of people through there who will get educated on the whole water cycle. This is where their whole education of the water cycle will occur in Singapore, and it, it can be very effective. For events and visitors, they plan to have sustainability events here, so people who are showing off the latest in environmental sustainability will, will use the conference halls. Tourists can take a water taxi there and enjoy the views. And then professionals and students are also expected. This is what the barrage looks like. <clears throat> Very modern in style, lightweight, uh, a, a lot of glass and aluminum, sort of consistent, and stainless steel actually more than aluminum, consistent with, with a lot of downtown Singapore at the moment. And yet when you walk there from the parkland, it'll just be a gentle ramp up. So if you're out there in the park walking up, you can walk up here and go right up on the roof of the barrage and enjoy the views. These are tremendous views up here. It's all grassed. Uh, you have full access 24 hours a day to it. Public use areas down below with refreshments, um, food and beverage outlets. The idea is the public can walk underneath the building. It, it is a large open span building. Uh, there's a little platform out here that's to view the gates as they open, and you can see the hydraulic nature of it. Knowing the Singaporeans are probably fishing off of it, but that's an unstated goal. You can't really state that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the park connector, which can, is that necklace around there, you could walk here. They will have shuttle, buggy shuttles that go along. Most importantly, there's a water taxi service that will deliver you right there that will connect all of the, the Singapore flyer to the casino, to the barrage. So you can go down there, have a quick snack, and come back and enjoy yourself. What they say, an iconic facade. Again, for CDM, this is a very interesting structure. It is really one which is showing off its, its pride in, in being a major facility. And then up on the roof, um, we have disabled access and, and an area with... Uh, some shade, so in the, in the heat of the day, you can go up there and look around and enjoy it. But the, the main roof structure deliberately was kept as grass to be consistent with the parkland areas. Central courtyard, uh, a lot of play areas for the kids with a, with a very shallow pool that they can play in. <clears throat> this is what they're designed to be able to do. Singaporeans can't stay out of the water. For those of you who've been in Vivo City or other places, you know you give them any bit of water, they'll be in it. The kids love to jump in it. The adults like to walk in it. So this, this thing is designed the same way. The temperature is great. It's always warm. You can, sorry, you can wade in the pool. You can enjoy it. There's parts of it, like this piece here, which are designed to show some of the relationship of the catchment to the local community so the kids can appreciate them. There are tiles in here which will relate places that are like Angmo Kio or Topile down to the basin. So they can, they can get a spatial sense of where they are. Underneath the, the, one of these ramps coming up, there's also food and beverage areas. Um, there's more exhibit space. So we use all of the space in the building for the public. And then subdued nighttime lighting. Interesting battle that went on between PUB and URA and N Park. Some people wanted it lit brightly. Some people wanted it to be toned down so it fits into the park. So if you look at it from the Singapore Flyer, you'll see the edges of it highlighted fairly well. If you look at it from the reservoir, it's a little bit subdued at the moment. Okay, technical features. I'm going to run through some pieces of this quickly. The two key areas to remember is all of this land where this is built is reclaimed ground. This was offshore, about a kilometer offshore until the late 70s when they started to fill it in. So there's a lot of marine clays and muds and everything else here. It's about a th 350 meters wide across the river. <clears throat> we have nine crest gates in here. Each one of them is about 90 feet wide, 27 meters wide for each gate. This is what each gate looks like in section. This is five meters tall on the gate. When it's open, it's like this. It's called a fish belly gate because it's hollow and it'll in fact float up and it shuts by itself. You don't have to force it shut, it's buoyant. These are stop logs that are in place to allow you to do maintenance work on the gate. There's a bridge that runs across the whole barrage structure, and there's a deep energy dissipation down here to try to get rid of some of the excess energy. Flood flows through this thing can be as high as uh, 2,000 cubic meters per second. Actual design load is 4,000 cubic meters per second, so we can get very large flows through here. 
Um, the biggest construction challenge is marine clay. As some of you who know Singapore know, we have underlying marine clays. The stuff looks like toothpaste. It has no shear strength at all. When you bring it up, it just goes flat on the ground. So the entire structure is on piles. They go down about 70 meters. So you've got a structure that's only 300 meters long with the piles underneath that are 70 meters. We drove about 850 such piles. It said pipes, there like should have been piles. These are meter, 1.2 meter to 1.5 meter in diameter. So it's almost 35 meters, almost 35 miles of piles underneath the structure. The cofferdams themselves are 42 meters deep, which is extremely deep for a cofferdam. Uh, just to give you an idea of it, here is the barrage gate structure up here. These are the cofferdams that were in place, but you can see the length of the piles underneath it. So this is like an iceberg. The bulk of the construction is way below the structure that you see up on top. These cofferdams were significant, but these piles... They were good enough. They know how to drive these piles in Singapore. We could put one of these in about every 18 hours when we were going well. So that, that's pretty good going, but a real construction hassle. The cofferdam design where we had to cut off the channel also had to penetrate down through these marine clays and be stable enough so we could excavate down to about uh, 10 meters below the water level and operate safely in that area. And that's quite a challenge in Singapore. So there's a lot of cross bracing, a lot of design of these going on. We used 144,000 cubic meters of sand. By the way, we've used about 140,000 cubic meters of concrete on the job to date. That's 20,000 truckloads, if you want to put it that way. So it's, it's, it's a lot of material. The biggest problem with the piles is, in fact, we were reaching the limit of the depth that even a 15-ton hammer could drive interlock sheet piles. When you get down 40 meters, you know, that's 120, 130 feet. That's, what, a 10-story building. That's the height you're driving. The sheet piles interlock. You can't drive them any further. So that's about as deep as you can go, but that's what we required, and we didn't have any construction problems. This shows you half of the channel with the sheet, with the cofferdams in place. This is the size of them. These are bracing required to allow us to excavate the deeper jump basin area in here. This cofferdam by itself wouldn't have been stable enough, even with the 42-meter piles, to get there. Now, hydrologic design, it really is designed to provide protection for essentially the 100-year flood event, although the nominal standard is five, five years with a lot of freeboard. We had 50 years of, of hourly rainfall data, and tide data that we could play with. And we tested it under a whole lot of conditions. And most importantly, we can handle the probable maximum PMP flows. This is uh, uh, just a quick um, result of one of the simulation models. This shows the existing tide level, for example. The red line is our design flood level. We want to be below that. This is a five-year storm, and we're controlling it by pumping. And this is the resulting reservoir level. So you can see we can stay below the level, but we were pumping on this particular case at about 240 cubic meters per second. This is because it was coincident with high tide. This is, this is the inflow hydrograph. This is frequently the problem of coincident uh, storms and high tide. This was flood risks that we presently have in the city. This was in 1974, three and four. During the final design stages, we got a little bit of what I would call nuisance flooding. But with the barrage in place, we can reduce the level by 0.9 meters. And that was actually only using two pumps running. So although the tide, the, the storm here was just about, just after the peak of the high tide, almost the worst of the conditions. This is how easily it could be controlled. So this was able to show that this kind of event would, would almost be a non-event once the barrage was in place. This is, shows what happened to the basin as a whole. These are a, a couple of years. This is the present monthly tide cycle. This is what we expect the reservoir to do during a typical year. You'll see it blips up following a storm event and then drops down fairly quickly. These are the gate operations. And there's the odd peak up here where we spike it up pretty much. But these are, these are typical flows, seven to 800 cubic meter per second inflow rates. 
Uh, control system, I'll skip over that. It's, there, is a, whoops, there is a model that actually will be running to help the operators control it, although we think you'll, you'll probably develop a seat in the pants feeling for it fairly quickly. The drainage pump station, the idea is that you can pump from this event in the, from the whole reservoir if you have a high tide and you have this storm event. So it's designed to pump the full five-year storm event against a maximum king tide. So if you had the worst conditions, you couldn't open the gates, the reservoir was at its maximum water supply level. If we're using the reservoir for water supply, we keep it a little higher. Then we can pump, it's actually about five and a half billion gallons a day. In, in round numbers, these things pump about a billion gallons a day per pump. So they're, they're big pumps. Uh, and we can run all seven of them, obviously. The head is about 13 feet at startup, but it's only two to eight feet once the siphon fills. So there's, it's, there really are low head pumps. <clears throat> this is what the pump station looks like. Vertical pumps in here. We feed it in through uh, intake channels and screens, pump it up through the siphon to recover the energy into a discharge channel. Relatively straightforward, other than the scale of the facilities. There are seven pumps lined up along the pump station. Two low-level sluices, which are a key factor of the barrage. In fact, we take the low-quality water off the bottom of the barrage, the semi-brackish water that collects and drain it out at, at high tide, at low tide. We have enough head on it. It's a system we've had in place on the Solatar Reservoir, and it helps tremendously to get rid of the stuff that accumulates on the bottom of the reservoir. These are what the pumps look like. The impellers are about 12 feet in diameter. The pump's about 35 feet long, electrically driven. Um, one of the issues was direct diesel drives, for example. I don't know how many of you have been in the Charles River pump station, but when you run the diesels in there, you can't help yourself think. Uh, so this was to allow us to have a visitor center, a whole building that was much more useful to the public. It also was actually easier to manage it. 8 to 1 reduction gearbox, they turn at about 120 RPM. So they're relatively slow running pumps. They're designed by Dutch guys, um, numerically modeled, and actually a relatively lightweight for their capacity. They're all stainless steel. This is a couple of them full on. If you want to see big pumps, these are big pumps. This is what you need in New Orleans, and they, they can be handled fairly easily. I mean, this pump station is bigger than most of the ones down in New Orleans when you put it in that light. It has huge pumping capacity. Pump erection was interesting. The pumps weigh about 27 tons. How do you get it from this to being vertical? They have an erection cradle and they lift it very carefully and it does a nice actually jig when it gets up on top because it will rotate a little bit. Jiggle around and then you lift it up and drop it in place. They were put in place before we put the roof on the pump station. Now you can lift them out and move them with the cranes in the pump station, but we put them all in place one after the other. This is now what it looks like in the pump station building. We're within a few months of being completed. So it's a big facility. <clears throat> Pumps are lined up here. These are the motors. The lower ones are the gearboxes. Um, and then this is another view of the facility. These are the, the rakes that, that clean the screens that protect the pumps. These are the rakes that move down the screens, which are in here, and keep the debris out of the pumps. Bar screen cleaners. These are the gates. Each one is about 90 feet long and weighs about 70 tons. They were prefabbed and dropped into place in a very precise operation. At the end, we were getting them in in about eight hours from beginning to end to lift them off the barge and put them in. They actually had to fit in at an angle of about 15 degrees because there's a cover plate back here that had to slot in, so it was interesting to drop them down. For those of you who've ever played with hinges at home, there's nine hinge pins on this and you're Oops, the tolerance is about two millimeters. Um, these are big stainless steel pins that had to be driven home. But it was, it was quite an interesting exercise. The interesting thing is to stand down here. This is when I said, as a modeler, heck, this is what I designed. Now I'm standing underneath it. If the crane is holding it and a few pins are in, it was actually moving with the wave action. So the gate was jiggling over your head. But it, it is tall. Um, the rest of the facilities that you require is hydraulically operated. Here's a gate that's open. There are stop logs that are protected at the top and the bottom. Whoops. 
We actually tested each gate by, by flooding it to see what the leakage rates were around the edge of the gate. These guys obviously trust the seals fairly well. They're, they're about six meters below the top of the gate here. This is the one at the upper end. But they, these are the realities of construction. You know, once you build a gate like this, the gate actually was manufactured by Kuramoto, a Japanese company, but manufactured in, in Taiwan, shipped to us on barges and fit into place. And we had every piece fit in place almost perfectly. I mean, to get those hinges in was, was quite amazing. This was the first test of a gate. You can see it here. The, the photos aren't that great. There was about a half a meter head difference. The gates just lowered here, and we're just beginning to get flow over the top here, the nap breakers, a bunch of us hoping the heck it works well. This is the hydraulic jump building up, and you had about flow depth about five meters. This is a lot of water moving through the system at the moment, quite stably. Uh, once it once it sets up, it, it and we operate it this way now, quite routinely uh, every few days to dump water out of the system. The bridge sections across it were also cast on barges due to site constraints, so we precast them. They weighed about almost 500 tons apiece, so, and we lifted them into the benefit of Singapore is we have some very large floating gear there. We had a 3,200 ton crane that could in fact reach out far enough to get over the copper coffer dams and, and reach the place and drop them in. And we were able to put two of these in place per day once we were moving with it. Just as well because the rental cost for a crane was about, it's 190,000 Sing dollars a day, so about 140,000 US dollars. You don't want to waste that. This is the size of the crane. The bridge section looks small compared with that. That's a, effectively a 30 meter long bridge section. The electrical building, we feed it with 20 megawatts of power. This is a big power hog if you want to run it all on the, on the main system. We normally contract enough power to drive two pumps, which is about all we need most years. We have three engine generators to back us up if PUB decides to generate their own power or for black start conditions if we have a power outage. This is a critical facility, unlike a lot of water supply plants, which can go offline for a while. The, the interesting thing is the 70 kilowatt solar power plant on the roof, something that's been added in the last year, and it's the largest in Singapore. And it provides all of the lighting inside in the building during the daytime. <clears throat> this is the electrical building by itself. These are just to give you a scale of the gensets. There's about uh, 1,200 square meters of solar panel on the roof of the building. We've got lots of space up there, so we can put in a big one. Construction progress photographs, uh, I've got a few minutes, I guess. Just showing the evolution of the barrage over the last three years. I've been there about three years right now. Um, the interesting thing is the temporary works were the most difficult part of the barrage. The actual final construction was relatively easy. This is a geotechnical nightmare area. I'm glad Andrew Whittle is here somewhere. We have exactly the same marine clays down here, in fact, thicker than the ones that led to the Nickel Highway collapse. So we have to deal with that. Everyone is very sensitive about it. This is the, the sheet piling. We're driven extremely deep. We drove about 360 kilometers of sheet pile on this job. In fact, we had 25,000 tons of sheet pile on site at any given time. We monitored the soil movements all the time. Very aggressively, we did get some soil movement and we corrected for it when it occurred. And you'll see in the pump station, we actually had to drive sheet pile coffer dams within the coffer dam to allow us to go down to stabilize it. Anytime you get more than about five meters below ground level here, the whole thing wants to heave up and you will move sideways. This is slippery stuff. And I want to show you what happened just upstream from us. If you think it's theoretical, this is how you can ruin your day very quickly. One of the other agencies surcharged a little bit along here, thinking they could consolidate the clays faster. All they did was they caused this thing as a slip failure to move out into Marina Channel. And it, as you can see here, now this is, all of this stuff now is unstable, and trying to get that back into the barn is going to be very, very difficult. It's only 200 meters away from us. Our concern is none of these, the piles down here are designed to take lateral mo movement like that if it occurred. There is about 300 to 500,000 tons of soil moving in this area here at the moment, and it's continuing to creep. It also has led to islands out here in Marina Channel because this is what you see. So it, it slipped on a typical circle. It moved outwards, moved down here, and came up out here. This should be five meters deep out here. Now it's at the surface. 
So at low tide, we have islands quite far out. This was the first day. Later on, it exceeded further out. You'll see all of these trees tipping backwards. And this is what it did to a revetment. So it sheared off the sand key. This is why geotechnical engineers get paid the big bucks and need to be careful. The remediation cost for this could be 50 to 80 million sing dollars just to restabilize it. How do you restabilize it is the big problem. So marine clays in Singapore are a nightmare. And we took a lot of precautions at the barrage site and uh, touch wood, I guess I should do it. We got through it, but it was very, very step-by-step, -step, be cautious, check yourself all the way. This is what the site looked like in April 2005, so just three years ago, basically a pristine site. September 2005, beginning to get the cofferdam built here so we could build a pump station in this area and over here. Also dredging Marina Channel. We dredged out a lot of old mud and muck that was in the system. It's better to get them out of any of these reservoirs before you convert them to drinking water purposes. For a couple of reservoirs in Singapore where PUB did not do that initially, they've been paying the price for 20 years of having to deal with, with low water quality. And it's almost impossible to correct because once you seal one of these off, you can't get these big dredges in there anymore. But if you take out a meter or two in most cases, this was a little deeper in some places, you get back to reasonably pristine conditions. By February 2006, you have the coffer dams in place. The channel is half open. We had to keep the channel open at the time because all the marine construction was going on and we're beginning the excavation work in here. You can see the excavation starting. This is where we had our biggest problems with this these slopes back here wanting to slide into the pit that we were digging. It wasn't out here where we had the copper dam. It was back in here. By February 2006, on the other side, we had this excavation pretty much under control. This shows you the, some of the marine traffic. And interestingly enough, for those of you interested in shipping, it shows you what we have offshore every time in Singapore is lots of ships. We get the odd, we used to get the odd intriguing ship passing through the barrage. This was a dinner cruise vessel. By September 2006, we actually had the first four bays complete with the gates in place. And this is what the inside of the pump station site looked like. These are internal cells with their own sheet piling because it was the only way we could get down to the bottom of it without the bottom heaving up on us. You could not excavate down here in one piece. This is the discharge channel, which itself had an inner line of cofferdams cross-braced that we could excavate within. And there, back here, actually, there's another line of sheet piles that were driven to stabilize the soil surface. So the geotech guys uh, earned their keep on this particular job. March, about a year ago, the first phase was complete. We're beginning to pull out the cofferdam because we needed to get that out so we could build the other half of the channel. This is what it looks like. All marine work is difficult because everything has to be unloaded onto barges and moved around. But here, uh, the gates are fully in place at this time. By last October, whoops, the second, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button here. The second half of the channel is complete. The pump station really, once it got above ground level, which is what it was doing back here, you're finally beginning to see it coming up above ground level, we could make rapid progress at that stage and begin to close it in. This January, in fact, the whole thing is now complete and we're, we're pulling out the uh, sheet piling. This is what it looked like about a couple of weeks ago. The bridge across is complete. This part of the channel is open. In fact, the gates are closed here. You can, if you know what you're looking at, you can see the closed gates. The building is largely complete. That's what it looks like right now. Here's uh, early February, we had just begun to start pulling out the uh, sheet piling. Now you can see the, the classic shape of the building emerging. These are the guys who are doing some other construction up here, and we're a little concerned uh, to make sure they don't dig too deep or cause a slip failure. Here's this internal ramp that's being cast. You can see the shape of that. <clears throat> this is the building. It's about, if you take the roof structure, it's about four football fields in size, just to give you an idea of the scale of it. So if you, if you line it up, that's, that's what you're covering. This is the internal pool. This will be the courtyard area. This deep cavern here, in fact, is the discharge channel, which is below it. In the original design, that was fully exposed. 
Now we've covered up most of it into a, a play area. This gives you an idea of the scale of the building once you're underneath the roof of it. Um, it needs a little bit of cleanup, but it, it's quite uh, dramatic. Um, this is just to show you what we face as economic competition elsewhere in the world. Just next door to us is, is part of the Singapore Port Authority. This is the world's busiest container port overall. They put through about 35 million containers a year, but contrast that to some of Boston's operation or even most of the U.S. ports. This is a huge facility, and the barrage is, is no more than half a kilometer away from some of this. This is the other area, and many of you may be involved in this. This is Marina Bay. This is where the casino and the integrated resort are being built. One of the benefits we get is we fly this every couple of months for aerial photographs for our construction. So we get a peek at some of what's going on in here that you can't normally see. These are interesting deep excavation for the foundations and for the garage structures. But this construction is about five billion US dollars is what they've budgeted for it. A lot of that comes from the way the barrage has changed the whole function of this downtown area. This is a new viewing platform that they've built. This is the Singapore Flyer. All this, this waterfront has been re redeveloped as well to have 24-hour-a-day activity and lifestyle, but the barrage is the key feature to it. We had to get rid of the tide out of this area. This is the Sustainability Exhibit Center. Just to give you an idea of this area here, which is a, is a unique design challenge for us because we're taking a big civil building and now we want to make it a museum of science almost. Within it, there's a few thousand square meters of exhibit space intensive exhibits which are designed, I went a little bit too quickly, to show a whole walkthrough that you can do to, to look at the history of water resources in Singapore. Uh, this is the kind of structure they want to build inside to get kids to play with it. It's very interactive. Um, this is to show the history of the rivers, how they, cleaned, how they got bad and how we've cleaned them up and where they're going in the future. Uh, the whole ABC program, which is active, beautiful, and clean waterways, has a gallery in here, which is where PUB will use to display the upcoming scheme. So Singaporeans will go there and see what, how their neighborhoods will change in the future. This is the place where you go to see it. This is a map of Singapore that you can walk on and see all the waterways and see the interconnected areas. And it has touch, touch capability embedded in it so you can see what's going to go on and what's going to change in your facility. Again, to educate the population as to what's going on. Fairly aggressive, fairly interesting, very state-of-the-art facilities, all built within this, what used to be a classic uh, public work structure. It's also going to have lots of exotic art. Well, exotic might be the wrong word. Lots of art. Fortunately, I don't select the art. Um, but there's a, there's a whole lot of environmentally sensitive art that's going to be in here. It's going to be an area where local artists can come and change and show off their, their skills. The water supply aspects, I don't want to forget about that. This was the number two and maybe number one justification initially, is we, we're going to pump the water to an upland reservoir about 15 kilometers long and store there prior to treatment. The key thing is there is no yield from marina reservoir as marina reservoir. The active storage volume is too small. So for those of you who are hydrologists, you know that to get yield from an area, you need active storage. In this particular case, we got the storage in an upland reservoir. So we skim floodwaters. That's why the, the pumping capacity is about 100 million gallons a day at the raw water pump station. So that's a huge pump station on its own right. But we get 30 million gallons a day yield by utilizing about 13 million cubic meters of active storage in Upper Pierce Reservoir. So we use reservoirs interactively. And Upper Pierce is one right now that's fed from one of the Malaysian sources that will be taken offline in 2011. So we get, we get double bang for the buck. We can treat it back to potable standards fairly easily, and it's about a $90 million scheme by itself. This is it. We've got to lay a 2.2 meter diameter pipeline through the core of downtown developed areas of Singapore. So that's a pretty big pipe any way you look at it. This, a lot of pipe jacking, a lot of directional pipe jacking involved as well to get it through the system. The raw water pump station, compared to the barrage, is a fairly simple structure. The intake tower out in the system will have a fountain to give us a little bit of aeration and mostly to keep the dragon boat racers from run, running over it. 
Uh, the interesting thing about the intake pipe location, which is in Kalang Bay, quite a distance upstream from the barrage. So if we had some soft water intrusion, we're not going to lose this facility. The infamous, I should be careful with that word, the Nickel Highway collapse was right here. Almost right on top of where we have to put some of our pipeline in place and where we have to also have some fairly deep structures to handle the intake pump. So this, this was as big a challenge in some ways in terms of, of uh, cofferdams and, and careful construction because all of this land was very much disturbed after that pr previous collapse. We also had the MRT driving its new pipe, the old circle line alignment was up here. They abandoned it after this collapse and they chose to drive it across Kaling Bay and we were given one month to get our structure in place and then they were going to drive their tubes underneath us. So the solution was in fact to build the intake pipeline on a barge. It ended up being 90 meters long, about 3 meters in diameter by the time you had the coating on it. It weighed 1,200 tons. We then sank the barge, floated the pipeline off and floated it in place and sank it onto cradles that we had, we had put in the bottom of the bay. It was uh, the only way to do this quickly and aggressively. We could not drive uh, sheet piles along this area because we couldn't guarantee we could pull them all out. And the uh, MRT construction managers were not about to allow us to have a sheet pile left in place where their TBM would run into it. So that was, you know, just one of the small little issues that we had to deal with. The status at the moment is all nine crest gates have been tested. Four of them are actually in use every day. The drainage pumps have been tested. The engine generators tested. The barrage has effectively been closed since last December. So the channel has been closed. We've been keeping the high tides out of the downtown area. They got through some fairly large storm events without any flooding. There's a boat hoist on the far shore that has been up and running. And, and we will be done um, in the next few months. There's a major Singapore International Water Week ceremony in uh, late June. They plan to have their closing dinner up on the roof of the barrage, so it'll be completed enough for that. And for those Singaporeans, we have the MM uh, planning to make a visit in June, which keeps even more pressure on everyone to get it finished. This is Singapore's long-term vision. They want to be the Venice of the East. They really want this to be a city of waters and gardens and interconnected waterways. The two major planning agencies, well, URA being the planning one, PUB with control of the waterways, are actively upgrading their stream corridors to be a city of the future. They're going to have pathways along them. The water bodies are being improved. So although there's still monsoon drains, they still have concrete edges on them. They want to soften it. The, the interesting thing here is you have to be careful because these places in tropical areas truly have to handle monsoon floods. So you're not going to make it an idyllic Indian, I mean English country little stream wandering along. The trick is what can you do with some of these major facilities? Do you bury some of them? Do you just soften the edges? How do you get by? It's, it's a quite a challenge that we're now moving into. But the Barina Barrage is the com key component of this vision for the whole downtown area. And in my view, it, it also really is an implementation of Freeman's farsighted vision of what an urban waterway should be. It's a different century, a different country, but it's the same idea. That's hopefully what it'll look at night if it's brightly lit. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have time for a few questions for those of you who want to stay, but uh, you know, feel free to, to leave if you uh, wish. Bob, do you want to? you the MC, or am I MCing myself? Yeah. You mentioned um, that one of the goals is lifestyle around the waterway. There was a photograph of fireworks. Right. Um, knowing that fireworks also have a lot of contaminants, perchlorate, HMX, all kinds of chemicals that aren't exactly friendly to waterways. I was just wondering if there's a lot of education on or work with the government on how people can also the uh, yeah, they're, they're aware of that, and this is the trade-off that will go on here. We don't need to run this system for water supply all of the time. We can flush the bay after a fireworks event in a couple of days if we want to. The places they have them are also relatively far away and on the other branch of the river from where the intake station is. So we'll sample it. 
we'll make sure the water quality comes back to good standards. Plus, everything is going to be run through a state-of-the-art membrane plant before it ever gets, gets drunk. But they even want to have, you know, F1 powerboat races in there with all sorts of exotic fuel. So it's an interesting trade-off that we're going to be dealing with. This is not simple, you stay out of the water because we want it clean. There's going to be a lot of active management, but the system is small enough, the rainfall is high enough, you can flush the system if you want to. Yes, sir. Do you uh, face any issues with dealing with uh, move, restricting movement of aquatic life between what's now the, uh, you know, the inner harbor and, and the estuary? Um, no, it, it's, you know, Singapore has done a, a, quite a number of these conversions of, of estuaries into freshwater activities. These estuaries actually, under heavy storm events, become almost fresh as it is. So we have a, we have a, a some marine life in there that can operate in this varying regime. Once we become fresh, you know, there'll be a little bit of a transition. We'll probably get a little bit of fish kill for a while, but um, there is a whole other stable freshwater population that develops very quickly. And this is probably the eighth or ninth coastal reservoir they've developed. They are sensitive to it, but unlike here, we don't have to preserve all of the same marine life as we have. Yeah. What type of soil marketing system do you have in for future movements or to determine? We are on the periphery of it, we have left a number of slope indicators primarily in place. Um, there's not many on the barrage itself. We drove the, the main piles are well founded and, and test loaded down into old alluvium clay. So we're not worried about vertical motion. We are worried about induced lateral movement from activities nearby. So there's, there's some, if you like, early, early wall warning systems on the periphery. And we're working actively with the other agencies to make sure they don't do something stupid near this facility. Just to raise that question, thank you for raising all the geotechnical points, but I was going to say they're also planning to build an underground highway outside the barrage. Right. I understand it. The obvious question is, was the barrage designed to handle it? Because they're essentially going to undermine the barrage on the outside. Uh, yeah, they're located about 100 to 150 meters downstream of us only. Um, and at the time the barrage was designed, that MCE, the Marine Coast Expressway, was not designed as a tunnel in that area. In fact, there was a lot of talk it was going to be a bridge. It, ha it has not, and they have to make sure that their system does not pose any lateral load threats to us. We have good relationship with LTA. Uh, it's too close for comfort, and that's one of the problems in Singapore, but that's where, where people have to work together. I think the geotechnical guys, if they're aware of it, can in fact manage it very carefully. They were talking about the soil stabilization project for the MCE being a half a billion Singapore dollars alone. Now, I don't know if that's just the, the tunnel piece or a little bit of the on-land piece, but that's 350 million US dollars just for soil stabilization. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the details, but they are very concerned and they, they know how critical it is not to move us laterally. Uh, and this, I mean, of, of all the places I've worked, this is probably the area where the geotech engineer really has to be on on the ball. The, the, the slip failure we saw was done with supposedly a geotech engineer who had looked at it, but I don't think he understood the Singapore situation well enough at all. In fact, they were lucky they didn't take out Shears Bridge. If they'd done that surcharging a little further upstream, they could have had a major problem. You can't turn your back on this stuff for a, a second. You have to be very, very careful. Yeah, Concerns, uh, just tsunamis and the like, uh, a big issue with the design of this thing, protect against that possibility? Well, it's not an active earthquake zone, so we don't have much earthquake loading on it. Tsunamis were, active, were actually not really considered at the time of the design, although subsequent to the one a couple of years ago, we added a buffer beam underneath the bridge structure, which is designed to take another meter or so yeah. of a minor tsunami if we got it. At that stage, the barrage protection is higher than all of the surrounding land area, so we'd, we'd probably overtop the, the reclaimed land next to us before we'd overtop the barrage, but they did add that in. We, we don't have an awful lot of space between us and, and the northern Indonesian islands, so there probably isn't enough room to generate a large tsunami wave in that, in that area. How sediments, I would assume that 
that the Singapore River carries a lot of sediment and probably you have to dredge yes. the reservoir? Um, they are actively working on an earth control measures of sediment control, trying to cut down the amount of wash off of sediment into the rivers from the construction sites. It's, it's very tough given the amount of construction going on. They, within the basin, we are going to have dredges and weed removal vessels to remove some sediment. The typical sediment we've seen in the Rocher Canal has been about one meter of sediment built up over about 15 years. So it, it, it can build up. But uh, that in that case, we were, we were triggering the suspension really where it, where it was the interface with salt water. Now it'll spread out a lot more. So dredging will be a problem. Most of the urban reservoirs there, they have not lost much, much volume to dredging. And we can hope that we can get this catchment back into the same area as the uh, Bedoxalatar scheme, where the, the loss of, of capacity is quite small. Internal uh, Singapore government funds. Tax monies, they don't have to, to float bonds for it? Or, um, or current, current income? I, I believe current income, the internal finances of Singapore are, are tough to uh, decipher, but they, they, uh, they run a very conservative budget and they've got lots of money to, to expend. They would not expend this money unless there was the economic return that they saw from the casinos and everything else. They are very careful that when they invest this money, they also, by the way, the cost of this barrage is about, the contract price, 226 million Sing dollars, but they bid it four years ago at a low spot in the construction costs. If you were to bid it today, the uh, scuttlebutt is it would be about 550 to 600 million Singapore dollars. So. Uh, they're, they're careful as to when they, they do the funding, and, but they have been, um, as a matter of policy, they have stayed away from dealing with agencies like Asian Development Bank and the World Bank because of all the other constraints that brings with them. They prefer to be self-funding for this, this type of activity. And 200 million Sing dollars is peanuts within the Singapore system right now. If, if you look at the amount they're expending on the subways, for example, or, or this Marine Coast Expressway, those are in the billions of dollars. This is small. Yes? Oh, up in the back. Uh, just a comment on the, <coughs> the, the comment you made earlier about the parallels on the public access side to um, the projects <coughs> in this country, and specifically you mentioned MWRA. I just happened to work for MWRA. But what you're seeing is um, response to the, the events of September 11th, and that really changed the whole paradigm where before when people were looking to site, particularly on the wastewater side, these kind of facilities, they tried to make them multi-use because that was a way of getting people in the neighborhoods to buy into these projects. And now, unfortunately, the pendulum is swinging the other way where the requirements for more and more um, you know, the intrusion detection and, and facility hardening um, is really kind of shifting the whole mindset of how these facilities uh, should be viewed. So, well, you know, Singapore has a very active JI terrorist group. In fact, the leader just escaped from jail within the last month or six weeks, which has been a source of some concern. They have security people who look at this and they make a trade-off as, as to what they can do versus what's realistic to do. And, and after 2001, there was this attempt to harden. To, the, the facility is hardened. There are vessel barriers and stuff that pre prevent you ramming this with a boat with explosives in it. But they have to be reasonable. You know, life has to go on. And I think the U.S. is still looking to find the happy medium have more eyes and ears on, to have more people there and actually being able to see what's going on is, is you know, in a lot of people's minds, the, the way to approach these kind of things. You're right to strike that right right and, and that's what exactly Singapore does. When you ride the subways there, there is a there is a little film clip that plays all the time that says, watch out for someone who puts a bag under a seat and gets off and doesn't take it with them immediately. You know, they're aware of the fact that people have blown up subways. CDM, I mean... Singapore has had a threat, an active threat, to bomb the subway system. So you, and they've had active threats against U.S. facilities and hotels there. But they seem to manage it. 
and they're prepared to move forward. They know life has to go on, and you're right. The more people who are there, the more eyes they have. That's how you deal with it. You, you can't get down into this, this bunker-down mentality. Yes? Right, and that's why it's fun to work in Singapore. The permitting process in Singapore is in effect if it bubbles up through the minister to the PM's office or whatever level office the decision gets made at, that's the permitting process. It, it is, uh, they will question, they will ask you a lot of detailed stuff, it's not a rubber stamp, but it, it does not end up stuck in a rut forever. And, and from the point of view of engineers, we have done more work in Singapore in terms of conceiving a scheme, designing it, building it, and actually watching it in operation. But Alkselaitar, I mean, it's had 25 years of operational experience. Here we'd be still trying to get it permitted. So the U.S. has to learn something from places like Singapore that are moving faster and quicker, but delivering extremely high-quality projects at the end of the day. And we have to learn what's the, what's the give and take. How do we get through the system faster? You know, people in Singapore don't bat an eyelid about new water. New water is new water. They don't have sewage treatment plants anymore. They call them water reclamation plants. They don't have sewage. They call it used water. There's a whole lot of terminology they've adopted that actually is very, very good psychologically to get people to think about water differently. But the population as a whole, new water, yeah, it doesn't taste very good, but what the heck, if I have to drink it, I'll drink it. You give them out free bottles of the stuff when they go to the government. Uh, in fact, if you go to meetings in government offices, you get new water to drink, whether you like it or not. Um, but that's what they, what they drink. The prime minister drinks it, and he's seen drinking it. So there's a comfort level. And, you know, for all of us, I must admit, when I brought some bottles back to CDM and took it to the corporate level and said, drink it, it was the most senior engineers who were the most reluctant to drink it. Everyone else tried it. We have to get past that, guys. Because if, if there's only a limited supply of water, what Singapore is is a test bed. We can really learn for what works there. We're capable of doing the same stuff in the U.S. No one's going to use new water directly, but as an industrial source, it's hugely beneficial. You can top up your reservoirs. It's there. We know how to do it. They've, they've worked it out. So permitting is an issue, and I, I wish in the U.S. you could learn some more of that, but for... For young engineers here, there's a benefit of working in some of these countries. As I've said, the first applications, real applications of, of all of that modeling development work we did at MIT was in Singapore. And the interesting thing is when I use the most recent models right now, they don't show any difference in predicted results than we did back in 82 or 83 when we first looked at the Bukatima job. So we weren't bad back then either. The codes were good. They were operational. Yes, sir. Insurance studies, the elevations, and, and if they do, if they thought about what's going to happen if you can't pump. Well, first of all, they don't have flood insurance studies, um, which helps. <clears throat> um, we have looked at the at the problems of a failure to pump. It it actually doesn't doesn't give you any worse a condition than you have right now. Because the other thing that that actually is buying you is at any high tide condition at the moment, once the barrage is in place, you're a meter and a half lower in elevation in the water, in the rivers, up inside this area. So you can take a lot of runoff before you even begin to get up to flood levels. So even if the gates don't open and the pumps don't work, you, you've bought yourself quite a level of protection. And for many small events, that's all you need. If the worst happens, you can open the gates. You're no worse off than with the, with the pumps not running. And you wouldn't open them until, until, you know, you'd filled up to be the same level as the tide. So that's the trade-off in this particular case. But again, fortunately for Singapore, most of the work they've done have removed the real serious flooding. We're talking about what I would call nuisance flooding, you know, six inches to a foot in areas that are used to flooding so they don't store anything. On, they don't have basements in this area anyway because of the lousy soil conditions. And secondly, they don't store anything on the ground floor of many of these shops. Yes. Any thought in the government, given that uh, there's a threat of rising sea levels due to global warming, and especially when, given that Singapore is a relatively low-lying area? 
Yes, they, they have studies underway to try to determine how much they should uh, consider raising some of the levees that are around the, particularly the reclaimed land. And we've also looked at the barrage's capability to pump against about another quarter meter of, of tide elevation if we need it. We're okay from the barrage point of view. The gates are high enough to, to take care of what we see as the immediate problem in the next 50 years. But they are working on it, and there are several studies underway. Well, they've already dredged it, and there is a disposal area that's off of Pulov Semakau, which was uh, another CDM-built island that's offshore. But but next to that, they had a deep pit that they were using for for disposal of this. Well, no, I mean uh, a lot of those decisions are fairly closely held until you have a need to know. Last question. Okay. Yeah, did they ever consider um, wetland and unnatural infiltration system, or is that a no-no because of the land price? Um, it's not so much the land. Well, it could be the land price. There's just no land availability. There is a move as part of this ABC program to develop some wetland areas as part of their upland watersheds or mid-level watersheds that take care of, of some urban runoff. They are implementing a water-sensitive urban design change in their code to try to get some infiltration. Wetlands for treatment are not really going to serve much purpose, you know, in an island this small with this level of rainfall intensity. That's the biggest problem. But Gardens by the Bay, which is that uh, development just next to us, are going to have two large wetlands on either side, and they are going to pump water slowly out of Marina Bay, circulate it through their wetlands, and put it back out into Marina Channel. So they will have some ongoing circulation on both sides. One comes out of Calang Bay, one comes out of Marina Bay. So, so they will have some induced extra circulation using wetlands. How effective they're going to be, I don't know. The biggest issue they have is leaky sewers, and they have an aggressive program worth um, several hundred million Singapore dollars a year to try to correct leaks in the sewers. And the, again, the problem with the sewer system is although they were built, some of them were built relatively recently, all of this underground construction, particularly the tunneling, has caused settlement and just cracks in the pipes. So they're, they're actively working to consider that again. For, so the geotech engineers, you know, they're just a nuisance. It, it is a challenge. Any tunneling is going to impact it. And even piling to this extent does cause slight movements nearby. We need better construction techniques for uh, what they call, um, you know, Storm sewer pipes would be, would be the way to put it here. Drains that are around the building that collect the sewers before they, they join up with the public sewers. That's where bulk, the bulk of the leaks are. Great. Thanks. Thank you.